It's a hint of Solomon, isn't it? Anybody know how many years ago Solomon did what he did? He became probably the mightiest king of Israel. How many years ago was that? You know, Tyson? Jack knows. How many? No, he doesn't. Doesn't know. Oh, you put your hand up and tell me you don't know. Anybody else? Any of the big people know how many years ago Solomon was king of Israel? Approximately within... 3,000. 3,000. I was going to say 3,000, so I'll give you a Mars bar when I think of it sometime. Yeah, keep me up to it, Ron. Yeah, good. Okay, so, but that's really an aside. But you can, you can see the humour of it, can't you? You can see the humour of the original story. The original story is a little bit like that, but it uh, involved a baby and two women fighting over whose baby it really was. And Solomon said, well, I'll find out who, it, who this baby belongs to. Bring me a sword and I'll have him cut in two and each of the women can have a half each. And uh, one of them spoke up straight away and said, oh, give, her, give the baby to her. And uh, Solomon knew straight away who the real mother was. So the wisdom of Solomon. Don't try that one, folks. That was just a little introduction, a little aside. Uh, we'll move straight on to, we can find out how this thing works. Way too many. Very clear. Uh, I don't know how it works. Uh, Val, it'll be up to you now. This is not working. I'm too far away from the... Uh, turn it off. Turn it off and turn it on again. No, still not working. All right. So you'll have to listen carefully, Tyson and Jack, because I want to talk today about a book that is much new, much newer. How old do you think the book of Hebrews is? I'll give you a clue. It's in the New Testament. The Bible is in two parts, isn't it? The Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is a fairly big book, fairly big tome. That's it, about there in my Bible. And the uh, New Testament has only got 27 books. And uh, Hebrews is right near the end. You all knew that. Jack, you knew that, didn't you? Right near the end of the Bible. Uh, I think we've got Hebrews and then James and then Peter and three lots of John and then Revelation. Oh, there's another one in there somewhere too, isn't it? Jude. Jude. And then Revelation is there too. So it's right near the end of the New Testament. And uh, Shibi and Rob and I have been delving into the book of Hebrews. It's not my favourite book of the Bible, not my favourite book of the New Testament. It's fairly complicated at first reading. But years ago, we had an evangelist come to the Burwood Church of Christ in Sydney, long before Tyson and Jack were born, and uh, he had written a book on the book of Hebrews and reminded us that really the theme of the book of Hebrews was that Jesus is greater, much like the uh, Muslims say, Allahu Akbar, you know, it means God is greater, but Jesus is greater than, can uh, anybody remember which uh, of the uh, earthly realms he's greater than, or even the heavenly realms? The first chapter, in fact, is about Jesus being greater than the angels in the angelic realm. That's the first two or three chapters. Jesus is greater than the angels. In fact, it says at the end of chapter 1 that they are really merely ministers. They're not gods at all. The uh, angels are ministers, ministering spirits to render service for the sake of the people on earth who will be among the redeemed that Neil has been talking about this morning those of us who have come to faith in God and more particularly in Jesus Christ. We are the ones that angels even now as we speak are being ministered to by them. And that's the first uh, greater than. Then he's greater than Moses. Moses was pretty great and given that the book of Hebrews is uh, 
talking to Hebraic people, Jewish people particularly, <clears throat> he's saying a mouthful to them to say that Jesus is greater than their great man, Moses. The lawgiver, the one who brought them out of Egypt, the one who did great things for God's people. Jesus is greater than him. And then we move on to uh, the next few chapters. That's where it really gets complicated in my mind that Jesus is greater than the priests, than the high priestly role of Aaron and his descendants. Well, we won't go into that this morning. I just want to point out a few verses from the book of Hebrews to remind us that if Jesus is this great, if he's greater than all of these things that God put in place for the sake of you and I, if he's greater than all of those things, then uh, he is somebody we need to listen to very carefully. Right? And that's, uh, I guess, one of the reasons why we make an effort to be at church on Sunday, where we make an effort to read our Bibles during the week, make an effort to be at a Bible study at least once a week also. And uh, so we read in the very first chapter of Chap uh, the very first verse, rather, of chapter 2, that uh, because Jesus is so great, we must pay close attention to what we have heard, so that we will not drift away from it. And if you remember, my last message was also from the text of Hebrews, and I mentioned this verse, that we ought to pay careful attention to the message of Jesus, to what we heard, so that we don't drift away. Just imagine yourself going fishing on a large river. But, guess what? Somebody forgot to fill the fuel tank and you get halfway up to where you want to do the fishing and the motor pumps out. Wouldn't happen to you, Les, would it? No. I mean, you're a sort of an organized kind of a guy. But uh, it does happen. And uh, when it does happen, you drift. Well, uh, hopefully you'd have an anchor on the boat. But otherwise you would drift. And uh, let's face it, there could well be the Niagara Falls up ahead. That's what the text of uh, Hebrews is saying. That if we drift, we will drift into a godless eternity. We will uh, drift beyond repair, beyond redemption. So we need to pay close attention to this message of salvation in Jesus Christ. How shall we escape, verse 3 says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? We won't. We won't escape. And I reminded you of that verse in chapter 6 and uh, the 19th verse talking about the hope that we do have if we put our faith firmly in Jesus Christ. This hope, this hope we have as an anchor for the soul. So never mind if we run out of fuel, if, uh, if we uh, come across, if we hit the rocks, if we come across tragedies, biblical circumstances in life, never mind, we have an anchor for the soul. We're in a safe place anyway, even if there's tragedy all around us. Well, let's see if we can move, let's see if I, oh yeah, well, well done. Did I do that or did you, Val? Well done, Val. Let's give Val the credit for that. So, the, the theme of uh, Hebrews then is Jesus is greater than all of these things that uh, we've been talking about this morning already so far uh, and uh, it reminded me of the Hallmark or the original Hallmark logo I think it was uh, Mr. Goodman himself in the 1930s penned the logo or the sorry the uh, slogan that's the word when you care enough to send the very best and it seems that God cared enough to send the very best to help us very weak 
human beings who need all the help we can get. Are you in strife one way or another at the moment? Uncertainties? Dogging your life? Some empty places there that need uh, ministering? Well, you're safe in God's hands. He can take care of those empty spots. And I've found over the years that it works for me. If I find myself in a difficult situation, I might lose a bit of sleep because I am prone, therefore, to begin the process of uh, working my way through a situation by worrying about it. Is that what you do? I mean, it's the human predicament, isn't it? We tend to worry first and then, oh, I better talk to God about this. And I found over the years that when I talk to God about these things that really seem like insurmountable obstacles at the moment, that God has a way of wonderfully, even miraculously, working them through to a good place. When God cares enough, He sends the very best, and it's in Jesus. We need to uh, be mindful of Him every step of the way, every day of our lives. By the way, I've got a, a, a sample hallmark greeting card up in the top right hand corner. This is just an aside now from the real message. Can anybody read it from back where you are? Yeah, well, let me read it for you. This is Rosh Hashanah, wishing you an especially sweet year. Well, it's a bit sentimental, but the top bit, Rosh Hashanah. Does anybody know what that means? Rosh Hashanah. Well, if I say it in Arabic, Joan will be able to tell me what it is. Ras Hashanah. Uh, the top of the year, the, the beginning of the year. Rosh is say, the Hebrew word. Ras is the Arabic word, meaning head. Head. Sena or Shana in Hebrew. Oh, the H-A, by the way, is the definite article. T-H-E in English, H-A in Hebrew. A-L in Arabic, or A-S, depends on whether it's a Kamariya letter or a Shamsiya letter. But that's an, another aside from the aside. So let's <coughs> come back to where we're supposed to be, Rosh Hashanah. I just left that up there when I did the PowerPoint presentation because uh, it occurred to me, well, yeah, this must be pretty well now. The new year, the new Jewish year started right at the end of September, the beginning of October. And so we're in the Jewish New Year as we speak. All right, let's get right back on track. And uh, let's uh, move on to the next slide. Wow, just have to say the word and it's there. We've got such good data uh, operators here these days. Thank you. So uh, we've got a message about Jesus to share with the world, right? Uh, we all in this room who know the Lord Jesus Christ and, and have come to realize that He is the way, the truth, and the life, we have to tell our friends and our neighbors and our world that Jesus is the way. We have to tell our, uh, our world about Jesus. So God sends His very best, Jesus, and He's got mailmen all around the world, postmen. Uh, messengers, that's you and I, we are his messengers. And incidentally, this is another one of his messengers. His name is Pastor Afif. Years ago, in the 90s, I was in the Middle East visiting our Miko missionaries, and uh, I visited this one, this particular one, in Amman, Jordan and went to her church that Sunday morning and Pastor Afif was the preacher. My Arabic was pretty rusty by that stage and I was able to pick out some of the words but it gets frustrating when uh, you can't really get the message. But anyway, uh, I was at church and enjoying the uh, fellowship of 80 or so Jordanian believers and this one uh, German missionary and uh, Afif was the pastor but a few years after that he started a ministry called AFTA 
I'll tell you what that means in a moment. But uh, when we were working, Joan and I were working in the Middle East, our leadership had the vision of the getting Arabs to be more proactive in their own evangelism. We missionaries were going, and we Western missionaries were going to the Middle East to uh, uh, convince Muslims that they should bow the knee to Jesus Christ. And uh, that work had been going on for already 130 years, and we saw churches all over the Middle East. We saw Islam still you know, rooted and grounded in society, but uh, we were you know, we were pulling Arabs out of their uh, Muslim background and uh, painting them in churches. And uh, we had a vision, our mission did, that, uh, well, the, our Arab converts should be doing this. And uh, it was pleasing to learn that Pastor Hafif put his hand up and said, I have a vision, I have a passion for my own people to uh, hear about Jesus Christ. And so he started a ministry called Arabs for the Arabs, after Arabs for the Arabs. And that's what he's been doing right around the Middle East. He's got quite a big team of workers in various Middle Eastern countries. So he's one of God's mailmen, if you like, one of God's postmen, one of God's messengers, taking the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to the Arab world. The last slide says that uh, the, uh, the world isn't always kind to God's messengers. There's a parable of Jesus told in, uh, I think it's in Matthew, ooh, I can't remember exactly where, where uh, uh, God was sending people to tell the Jews to repent. And one by one they were killing his messengers. And of course, this is what's this is the story of church history and Jewish history. You know, you come with good news and you get killed for it. And lots of uh, martyrs for Christ in uh, the church era. So we've got to be well prepared as God's messengers. And I think part of the problem of the Western world uh, moving away from Christianity has been. Part of the problem, anyway, has been that, that God's people, the church, hasn't been able to articulate their faith well. Thank God for the John Dixons, the Ravi Zacharias, the Billy Grahams of a uh, previous era. Uh, but by and large, the average person in the pew isn't able to give an in depth reason to their neighbours as to why they believe in Jesus Christ. Oh, they go to church, but when the, uh, the neighbor asks some difficult questions, they don't really have a clue. They can't turn to the Bible and quote a, a verse, or they can't quote uh, the latest scientific discoveries and say this is evidence that uh, there is a God and uh, that the flood did happen, just as the Bible said. Christians have become pew-sitters and simply content to let the, the preacher do the hard yards. But not even the preachers are necessarily all that good. Uh, we in the West need to be counted and be able to give an account of the hope that is within us. So it's a battle. That's why I put those first verses, that verse of the one of my favourite school days poems up on the screen. Just to illustrate that this world is a battlefield and uh, there is a lot of resistance out there. By the way, this is a verse, the first verse from a poem called War Songs of the Saracens and the Saracens, it was an English word coined to refer to the Arab masses that were massing, amassing their armies to uh, win the world for Islam. You know, the, the, uh, the armies of Muhammad and his caliphs, his successors. 
And so this is a poem that James Elroy Flecker wrote about the uh, marching Muslim armies, marching from the eastern lands, from in India, uh, Persia, and uh, then through the Arab world block, and moving westward towards Europe. Their next goal was to capture Europe. And so that's what this poem is about. Hail kings of the sunset beware. We are they who ride early or late. We storm at your eye brigade. Hail kings of the sunset beware. Not on silk nor in samet we lie. And I have no idea what samet is. Can anybody enlighten me? What is samet? I looked up my dictionary. I googled it. All I can imagine is that it is uh, a Persian word and uh, it probably refers to some, you know, something that you would find in a king's palace, a, uh, a very comfortable mattress probably. So, not on silk nor in salmon we lie, not in curtain solemnity die among women who chat and cry and children who mumble a prayer, but we sleep by the ropes of the camp. And we rise with a shout and we tramp with the sun and the moon in our hair. Yeah, it's a powerful uh, poem, but it reminds us of the battle that we, thank God we're not facing the, you know, the Muslim armies literally, but uh, we are facing an enemy called the devil and his cohorts, right? And uh, at every turn we make, there is the devil seeking someone to devour. So let's do our homework and let's be diligent. I've just turned to conclude with these four, three, nay three, there could be about 15 if you go through the book of Hebrews and single them all out. By the way, somebody has suggested that the book of Hebrews is a book of salad. Well, particularly lettuce salads. Lettuce this, lettuce that, lettuce let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as is the habit of some, as in chapter 10, verse 23. And there's a few lettuces here on my page, but not good enough to eat, but good enough to remind me that I need to be diligent about the things of God. And I start with verse 11. Let us be diligent to enter that rest that God has for His chosen people. So that no one will fall uh, through following the uh, is children of Israel's example of disobedience. You know, when they were exiting Egypt in that 40 year pilgrimage. Let us be diligent. We've got to do our homework, Christians. We are a volunteer movement, it would seem, on the face of it, at the human level. But really, when it comes to Jesus and the kingdom of heaven, there are no volunteers. We are enlisted men and women, and we are in the Lord's army, quite literally. We are the ones who are to, to march and uh, make the world fear us. And so that's why my daughter is dedicating most of her working days to uh, speaking up on, uh, on her webpage developments uh, for various organisations like the Australian Christian Lobby and others just reminding us of the moral issues that we as a nation are facing in our day and age. So let us as Christians then be diligent to know our faith and to be stand up and to stand up and be counted for Jesus. Let's get to know our Bibles and let's get to know how we can refute those who put up arguments against us. And uh, let's face it, I've been hearing it time and time again lately that the atheists, the uh, atheists who dwell on their textbook Darwinian evolution the, uh, and, and uh, his theories, the atheists know their Old Testament and they <coughs> dig at us where it hurts. You know, they pick out the seemingly uh, discrepancies in the Bible and inconsistencies and they throw that at us and we have to have an answer for the atheists because we're living in their realm in Australia in our day and age let's not just have a sentimental faith let us be diligent to enter God's rest 
What's the next one? Hold on, verse 14. Let me see what that says in the broader text. Since we have a great high priest, that is Jesus, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heaven, who has ascended into heaven, uh, we celebrated his communion when he was killed for our sins, uh, but rose again. Never forget that, that uh, Jesus who died rose from the grave and ascended into heaven. So, since we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Let's hold on to it. Uh, if we are attacked because of it, let's do our homework and find out how to answer those who attack us for our faith. Let us do our homework. This is my letters for the day. Let us hold on to our faith. And uh, we can be sure that if we hold on to Jesus, we are holding on to uh, a, a real rock, to uh, an anchor for our souls, and an anchor for our mind, mind you. But the final one is in verse 16. Well, the final one for this morning, it's up past 10 now, and I could go on to 11 o'clock. Uh, would, would that be in order? Uh, no, we're not bothering about morning tea this morning, are we? No, let's move on. Uh, I see there's some people here looking for looking for the end. Well, the end is inside. It's verse 16. It says, and this is one that most of us as Christians memorize uh, to have as part of our repertoire and part of our uh, comfort in, in the battles of life. Let us draw near. In other words, don't hold Jesus at, a, at arm's length. Uh, let's not... Uh, be complacent about our faith, but let us confidently draw near to Him. <clears throat> let us draw near to the throne of grace. Well, that's talking about the place of prayer, isn't it? We can pray confidently to Him, <clears throat> knowing that He will listen to us in our prayers. Mind you, Thomas Cranmer still got burned at the stake, and, and Chinese pastors still spent 23 years in a Chinese prison. And right now we're praying for some in the Middle East who have been there a long time in the name of the Lord. But in their confinement, Christians find that strength by drawing near to the rock they can hold on to, Jesus Christ. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we might find mercy. But more than that, it goes beyond mercy. Mercy says, oh, I'm not going to kill you for being a sinner. He says, and find grace to help. So we don't, being Christian now, by believing in Jesus, we don't get what we deserve. We don't get death, eternal death. No, more than that, we get even gifts given to us. We get grace. We don't just get what we don't deserve, but we get what... Let me rephrase that. Let me wind the tape back. We don't get what we deserve, that is death. Uh, but we get what we don't deserve. Gifts from God. Uh, a blessed relationship with God and uh, much protection and much providence many things provided for us this is the last sermon that you should be will be hearing before you take the message of gospel back to next japan oh you're going to be here next sunday pray for shibi he's going back home to see his family in uh, japan in a week or so's time but in the meantime all of us can draw near to god in prayer and that's something that we haven't announced uh, but that uh, this is the last Sunday of the month so we will traditionally have our after church after morning tea prayer time if you can stay no obligation on anybody but uh, now would be a good time to draw near 